is a photographer, writer, and a lecturer. He's an expert in interpreting the built environment. He's not a stranger to this stage. His take on everything, on the built environment, his emphasis uh, is, looks at the complex political, social, and racial forces that shape our spaces and places. Um, his architectural uh, photography, which is featured in his new book, Southern Exposure, the Overlooked Architecture of Chicago's South Side, has been in numerous magazines, periodicals, and publications. He's the former architecture critic for the Sun-Times. He was the deputy chief of staff for architecture under Richard M. Daley. Um, and now he, uh, it, among other things, is really uh, going around town speaking about his book, which we have a few copies left at the end of this lecture, so they'll be available for sale. And if you haven't already got your book signed, he will sign it in the back of the room as well. So that being said, thanks again for coming, and here's Lee. Thank you, Hallie, and um, thank you all for coming. Wow, it's a big crowd here tonight for a cold night. I, uh, I appreciate you coming out. Um, oh, oh, oh. We this Me too, I, I could too. Switch this. There, now you There we go, all right. <laughs> a little advertising never hurts back there, right, doesn't it? Well, well thanks so much for, for, for coming out. Um, and, and thanks so much for the support of the book. Uh, when I got the idea to write this book, and actually I can't even say that, when the idea was given to me to write this book uh, by an editor, uh, Jill Petty, uh, at, the, um, at Northwestern University Press, uh, I had no idea that it would be this, it would cause as much of a stir uh, in, in a good way. I remember telling a buddy of mine, we grew up together on the South Side, I said, it'll just be me and you drinking beer and flipping through the, uh, the, the book. So he moved to New York, so I never chance, didn't get a chance to get the beer, but uh, I'll, still, I'll still work on it. Uh, so years ago, and, and, it, and it must have been more than 15 or 20 years ago, because one of my daughters, now grown, uh, was, was small, uh, you know, a baby, and I was up one night with her. And, uh, you know, she's crying, and I'm, you know, feeding her, rocking the baby, and, and uh, turning on a television set, and, um, and the movie Lifeboat is on. This is an Alfred Hitchcock movie from 1944. And uh, you know, you know the, if you know the Hitchcock, you know the story, right? The Nazis have torpedoed this boat, and the survivors, five of them, are all in, on this boat, and they're sort of hanging on, and the drama ensues, right? So it's like the love boat, except there's no love, right? <laughs> so one of the characters is um, played by Tallulah Bankhead, right? Great old school actress. And, she uh, is all classy and has that mid-Atlantic accent. And they're on the boat, and she takes a look at William Bendix, and she says, uh, you are a low person, darling, obviously from the gutter. That's a hell of an opening line, isn't it? And she says, the funny thing about it is, I'm from the same gutter. And William Bendix, without missing a beat, says, South Side? <laughs> so, I thought, so I can't throw anything at the television because I got the baby in my hand. So I thought, you too, Hitchcock, you too. So she goes on to tell William Bendix that she was raised in the back of the yards. Her character was raised in the back of the yards neighborhood by the stock yards. And this Cartier bracelet that she has on her wrist is her ticket, was her ticket from the stock yards to the Gold Coast. So naturally later on in the movie when something happens and the bracelet slips off her hand and goes down to the deep blue sea, I say what we all Southsiders say when someone gets to come up and that's what your ass get, right? <laughs> but, but in that story, though, there's a bit of a truth, an uncomfortable truth, which is the South Side of Chicago, for many people outside of Chicago, and many, too many of us inside of Chicago, is seen as a place that you flee from. She didn't say she went from the back of the yards to Beverly. That would have been a step up but to the Gold Coast, right? She didn't say she went to Hyde Park or, or she went to the Gold Coast, right? And, and so the South Side is a place to flee or avoid altogether. And that is sort of the basis of the book, the, 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 uh, the premise of the book, the kind of driving idea of the book, that the South Side is not, it's seen that way, and it's not a place to flee, uh, but it's a place to invest, uh, a place to embrace, uh, a place to love, and that, and that the people there uh, are not people to avoid, 
their houses and, and places are not places to avoid. That, you know, it, the South Side is in slums, it isn't all that, but there really are great buildings. And not only that, the book makes the argument that the best architecture in the city outside of downtown is on the South Side of Chicago. Now, when, when this book came out and we, we, we got this cover, this was not my pick for the cover. My pick was Pride Cleaners, which uh, many of you may have seen it. And, uh, but we, I, got, I got outvoted on that. Uh, but the reason why it's on the cover, but more, more importantly, the reason why it's in the book at all, this is Errol Saarinen's uh, law library at the University of Chicago campus, is because of this. Two years ago, maybe three years ago, I was watching this beautiful PBS documentary on Saarinen. Uh, I think his son was one of the producers of it. Fantastic work. Looks at the body of his work, the TWA building, the St. Louis Arch, all the collegiate work that he did. And I'm watching, and I'm thinking, well, they're going to get to the law library because that's a great looking building. And next thing I know, the credits are rolling. And I thought, geez, can I, if a Saarinen can get overlooked on the south. So, you know, being a south sider, you're thinking about all kinds of things. Well, if that building were downtown, they wouldn't have missed it. If you were on the north side, real or imagined, they wouldn't have missed it. I bet you they overlooked it because it's on the south side. Yes, it's on the University of Chicago campus, but it's on the southern tip of the campus. And, you know, doggone it, they, you know, the south side gets overlooked again. And in some ways, that um, documentary gave birth to the exhibit that this originally was for the 2017 Architecture Biennial, and then the exhibit give, gives birth uh, to the book. So that's the reason why it's there. So now let's uh, let's jump in. This is another uh, view of the book of the of the of the library. But what a fantastic building! Built in 1959, so it's one of Saarinen's later buildings. His career is so short anyway. Uh, but uh, you see this bed above this Bedford limestone base this beautiful folded accordion-like facade, right? It just looks like it just hovers there. And then the, um, and also Dan Kiley uh, did the landscape architecture for it. So this pool and the other work around it. So it's just a beautiful building. It's pushed far back from the street. So many people don't, don't see it. It's behind a gate. But if you get there on the right time of the day, and I would say August 15th, 2016 at 6.25 p.m. Uh, is, a, is a great time to get it. Just when the sun sets to the south, to the northwest, and the light shines across it and kisses the front of that building, it's, it's one of the city's most spectacular buildings. I didn't like, though, I didn't like this. <laughs> didn't like this building. I photographed this building years ago, and that building wasn't there. And we fiddled around with whether should we take it out, should we Photoshop it out. I really want to. And I think it takes a crop. See, even on the cover, we don't like it on the cover. <laughs> But we left it in, and with my luck, I would have taken it out and left the reflection in the water, and then people would have been calling me up about that. <laughs> the building's a ghost. That's where it should be. But a, but a fantastic building and worth seeing. Another detail as we get close to it, just how rational, geometric uh, that the building is. Just a beautiful piece uh, of, of, of architecture. Now, this is the, my favorite of the book. This is Pride Cleaners at 79th and St. Lawrence uh, in the Chatham community. Now, this is a fantastic piece of post-war architecture, a little bit of googie in there if, you, if you're into the architecture of, of uh, Southern California. So this is a hyperbolic paraboloid roof. So it's a self-supporting concrete roof. And it's not just done that, that way just for kicks. Inside of the cleaners, it's very tight, very economical. Uh, uh, space-wise. So by using a roof that supports itself, you don't have to have columns and things taking up the, taking up the, uh, the, uh, the room. So the building is by Gerald Seagward, who was a graduate of Shures High School. I don't think he went to college. I think he, whatever he learned in Shures, he was able to take that throughout the rest of his career. Um, Chatham is a predominantly a community built up by the, 19, by, the, by, the, by the 1930s, 1920s and 30s. It's predominantly built. If you go down 79th Street, that's the street that's kind of behind us, you'll see these great terracotta buildings from the teens and 20s. And then, of course, after the war, construction begins to kick up again. And can you imagine this building, this Cadillac Fleetwood of a building with Chuck Berry playing on the radio loudly, roaring into this traditional space? Uh, it, it was built as a dry cleaners. It still is a dry cleaners. And in fact, a new owner, after I took this photograph a year later, actually has bought the building and actually spruced it up a bit. The old owner, and I hope he's not here tonight because I'm going to say something embarrassing. Um, when I told him that uh, the build, this photograph is going to be the museum exhibit, I was trying to get him to replace this window. 
And, and, uh, he, and he wouldn't do it. He says, oh, it's great. You know, thank you for coming out. You know, thank you for, for photographing it. So now he, this building is, is, um, is uh, this, that board has kind of been memorialized. The new owner actually uh, saw the book, saw the photograph, and said, why is that board there? I took it off. And I had to explain to him, you know, that was before you bought it. But, uh, but a fantastic piece of architecture. Now, what's also good about this, so you've got this building here. And again, let me just back up a little bit. So why does the building look this way? It's often the question I get. So by 1959, you're getting a few things happening. You have, you, you, you've got the dawn of the space age, right, which begins to impact design of cars, engines, Rocket 88, Oldsmobile engines, tail fins on cars. You know, so, the, so the space race begins to shape um, design and begins to shape, in some respects, architecture. This thing points skyward. You also get a sense of a change where 79th Street, uh, by uh, before the war, was a slow street traffic-wise, right? You walked by it, you strolled by it. If you're in a streetcar, you went by it, I don't know, 15, 20 miles an hour. After the war, everybody's got cars, people are zooming down the street. How do you catch the um, attention of the passerby? Uh, there's also another thing happening uh, uh, technologically, which is you can get your clothes clean faster. Back in the old days, you put your clothes in on a Monday, you don't know when the heck you might get it back. Friday night at 8 o'clock or something, right? But here, uh, you can get your clothes back the same day, within a few hours, the next day. So all of these kind of triumphs kind of meet together with this building. How do you catch the eye of a uh, driver uh, going down the street? Southern California, the car culture of Southern Cal California knew how to do this. You make a building that's almost advertising in of itself, that it grabs the eye uh, as much as the sign does. And speaking of the sign, if this thing isn't the coolest thing in the world, <laughs> it looks like it should be telling you that uh, Peter Lawford and, and, and Frank Sinatra and uh, Sam Davies Jr. are going to be at the Sands tonight, right? But this is Pride Cleaners, beautiful sign, still there. Now, I'll tell you this. Years ago, years ago, when I was in the mayor's office, uh, me and a guy named Ken Davis, who, owned the, who ran the city's municipal television channel, we both liked this building. So we went and we took some video of the building at the time. This is way back in 2003, I guess. And uh, we got the owner, the previous owner to the guy who wouldn't fix the window, we, we got the owner to turn the sign on. And the thing still worked. It's blinking, it's buzzing. We're standing in the grass that you see to in the front here. And you could hear the thing uh, buzzing and clicking. So I said to him, uh, to Ken, tell that guy to turn this thing off because it's going to be me, you, and Mrs. O'Leary's cow all together <laughs> in the history books for having burned the city down another, another time. But, uh, but a great sign. The new owner who has the building appreciates the sign and luckily uh, wants to repair it so he's been able to get, hopefully by now, finally get together with the city's landmarks officials to find a way to, to get the sign back on and, um, and, and work and functioning again. Here's another building that I, I like so much. This is, um, it's now GN Bank. It's a Ghanaian owned bank, but it was originally Illinois First Federal um, Savings and Loan, uh, African American Savings Institution, Lending Institution, right at 46 in King Drive. And you know, King Drive, much like the streets in Chatham that we saw, you know, it was a really traditional, you know, pre-war street. And then this beauty comes along. Um, it was designed by a group that really needs to be taking a look at. So taking a look at. So if you're, you know, other writers and researchers here, uh, take this burden off me. Otherwise, I'll have to stay up all night looking at this. Uh, it, it's a place in St. Louis, and I'm going to get the name only 80% right. But it's the um, the Bank Builders. The Bank Builders and Design Something. It's an entity out of, out of St. Louis. And they would design banks, kind of design build thing across the country. And they always, um, they, they were in existence before World War II, but after the war, uh, they really kind of came into their own. They would borrow uh, design styles from whatever was hot at the moment, whatever, um, you know, Saarinen building or SOM building or, or, or Gordon Bunshaft building or whatever. And you can see them incorporating a little bit of it in, in the banks around. If many of you who might be from Beverly, anybody from, from Beverly, do, if you might remember, uh, there was a building, there was a bank building, the old Chesterfield Savings and Loan that was at 108th and Western, had these fantastic, uh, I, I forgot how tall these columns were, uh, around, the, around the building, overhanging roof with columns su supporting it, uh, and kind of glass box inside, beautiful building that got, um, uh, unfortunately, 
I don't want to say restored, because they didn't get restored. It got remodeled, and they took away all the character of the building. But it's a great looking building. That was their work, too. Now, here's one of my favorites. This is Chicago Vocational High School on the south side, 2100 East 87th Street. Most people see this building when they're leaving town on the Skyway. And when I was at the Sun-Times, I would get a call at least once a season from someone saying, what is that factory down there on 87th Street? Now, it's not a factory, it's a high school. You should go take a look at it. But uh, this building, which, is a, which unfurls itself down 87th Street, almost two blocks, maybe two blocks, and then goes down Anthony to the north and uh, Crandon to the north as well. One of the finest Art Deco buildings that you'll ever see in the city, particularly uh, one that's not a skyscraper. It might even be the largest non-skyscraper Art Deco building. This is the um, gymnasium entrance on the far east side of the school, so this is closest to the Skyway. But, uh, I mean, just look at those columns, right? Fantastic. I mean, going, I'm, I'm a graduate here, so I class of 83. And even then, going through, you kind of felt like a Roman soldier going in, you know, going through, going through those columns, even though you're going to play dodgeball or something, something mundane like that. Um, inside, uh, across the face of the school, are these bas relief um, uh, insets that each tells something about the discipline that was taught at the school. So. Print shop had an old printing press and you know, that kind of thing. Car had a had a wheel and that kind of thing. But a, but a fantastic school. This is the the main entrance. This is kind of funny. Uh, it says it was built in 1938. It's a bit of a lie. It was built in 1941. Uh, they hit a construction delay and the building didn't get complete and completed until 41. But this being Chicago, they put 38 on it anyway, right? <laughs> but what I really like about this is the font here where it says Chicago Vocational School. Uh, that font is called Broadway, and um, it was only about 10 years old when the school was designed. So the idea that the school has its classic roots, as many academic buildings did, uh, but also that it, was a, it, was a, it, was a, it would herald the future in some way. The planners of this school saw the 20th century as this mechanized, mechanized century to come, where there's always going to be air conditioners to fix and cars to repair, and the idea was to created a school that did that for 4,000 men. Women weren't allowed in the early days of school. And then the, after the war broke out, and then um, I think the Marines or the Navy had it for a while, then after the war, it reopens again as a vocational school, and then girls were, were, were let in. Um, my fear about this school is that it is not a landmark, neither is Pride Cleaners. And without landmark protection, um, it can be altered in ways that are unsympathetic. So there, there, are, there are a group of alum who are looking to change that, and, uh, and I, wish them well, and of course the book argues for landmark protection for the school. Uh, this, looks like a, this looks like a Frank Lloyd Wright house, doesn't it? Uh, this is the John Van Bergen house. This is the Alan Miller house in South Shore. Well, someone here was, someone here was their father that's from South Shore, so, uh, so maybe he, he this, is familiar, this, will be, this will be familiar to him when he reads the book. This is at 71st and Paxton. Beautiful, beautiful house built based on Frank Lloyd Wright's um, a uh, fireproof house under $5,000 that, 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 uh, that he designed. Van Bergen plays with the volumes a bit, a little bigger. There's a porch that you can't quite see uh, to the left, to the, to, the, to the right, I'm sorry. Um, but still look, looks good. This is the family that owns it. Actually, um, these are friends of mine. Joanna Trotter uh, and I worked together at UFC. This, and, and their kids are much bigger than this now, so this picture's kind of funny to see. Uh, but uh, I, asked, I asked her, I was almost done with the book, and I said, can I shoot your house? Yeah, come over. And, um, you know, one of my favorite photographers is Julius Shulman, who, who um, photographed uh, the, um, the kind of easy living Southern California houses uh, and always had people kind of laid around, the, you know, laying around the house all relaxed. So this is kind of an ode to that. Although I didn't have to pose them, they did it themselves. I just took credit for it. But here you, get it, you see the porch behind them, uh, you know, the Beautiful fireplace, the wood, fantastic um, piece of architecture. Going through it, here's another uh, you know, unique house. This is the Ingram House. Uh, this is at 65th and Ingleside, kind of like in, in Washington Park, Woodlawn. Um, built in 1959 for uh, a um, doctor, an African-American doctor, and designed by an African-American architect, Roger Marjoram. And um, you know, as you can see, if you look around the edges of, the, of it, and there's a, another photograph, a different view in the book, uh, it's a, like, again, it's a traditional neighborhood uh, built before the war, and then this building comes along in 1959. 
as you can see, and probably guess, Roger Marjoram studied a little bit under Mies van der Rohe at IIT. Now we go inside. Now this build, this photograph didn't make the build, didn't make the book because I overexposed the lights. But I like to include it sometimes because, so you enter in on the side, right? So you would you would enter in through this gate, right? And you get in the house. Who who whose idea was this? So so the door is there, and then there's a spiral staircase that leads down to the basement to a bar. I mean, the thing literally turns down and deposits you right at the bar. And the living room space is covered up, is obscured by this beautiful curved wall. So, you know, you just imagine when you're crazy like I am, you know, someday the people being entertained in the living room, you don't want to see them. You come in, you go down the, the spiral staircase, hey, how you doing, baby? I'm doing fine. And you go straight to the bar, right? <laughs> this house is for sale. It was 150 and it, and it wouldn't sell for a long time. A friend of mine lives down, this, down, down the block. Actually, it was for sale when I photographed this, took this photograph back in 17, and they finally did find a buyer for it, and I'm afraid, I, I tell her, don't tell me what they're doing to the house, because if it's something terrible, I might cry. While I was there, I found this um, interesting, this is the other side of that, of that curved wall. I found this uh, home intercom system, and I want to take a picture of it, and I wonder, does it work? So I turned it on, and sure enough, I could hear my voice in the kitchen. It did work. That was good living back then, I tell you. Uh, this is the Yale Apartments at 65, 65 South Yale uh, in Inglewood. Inglewood, of course, was a suburb like many neighborhoods were in Chicago that later on gets annexed, annexed by the city. Um, but this gives you a sense of the architecture uh, and, the, and, the, and the caliber of the suburb in the late 18. Um, in the late 1800s. Uh, this is by John T. Long, who was a, an architect who was a disciple of, of Sullivan, and you can see a bit of it here um, in, the, in the detailing here. What's interesting about this is when I first saw this building, well, first saw this building as a, as a writer, I was at the Sun Times, and the building was on the verge of collapse. Um, I remember uh, it was me, the developer, just the would be developer. And I want to say Arenda Troutman was the alderman at the time. And we got on the roof of this building, and it was like a sponge, right? Why were we up there? I was young and didn't know any better. And uh, this developer, who was coming back from a White Sox game, when he spots this building and decides he wants to invest, he ends up putting together the capital stack of low-income housing tax credits and everything and restores this building. Many of you have probably seen it on Old House, on Open House Chicago, that, that, uh, C, that the CAC does. And you see this beautiful interior uh, of the building, uh, which is much like the Brewster Apartments or the old apartments that you see on the, um, you know, in like Paul Mooney movies where the, the criminal's in the elevator and he's going up to chase somebody. And, you, and as, as he rises up, you can see the floors, you know, ring, you know, ring in the courtyard around it. Beautiful building. Uh, largely seniors now. Um, and I, there's a funny story about it. But ask me during the q and I'll tell you the funny story about what happened when I was photographing this building. Uh, luckily, we're getting, to the, getting, getting close to the end. This is, um, speaking of Frank Lloyd Wright, this actually is a Frank Lloyd Wright house. This is the Foster House and Stables, 12147 South Harvard, because this house haunts me in my dreams. Um, it's been for sale for three years now, maybe almost four, for $175,000. It really, really was, was originally 185. They dropped it down last summer. There's a, it's a kind of a humorous, re humorous reference in the book to the price drop. But um, this is a unique house for Wright, built in 1900, a summer house for Stephen Foster, not the Camp Town races, Stephen Foster, but a guy who was um, uh, president of the West Pullman Land Association, which develops as part of West Pullman. And a beautiful house, needs work, but still is livable. Now, what's not in the photograph, not, what's not in the book, I'm going to take you inside and give you a sense of what the inside looks like. Um, this staircase, this stairway, I like. The carpet, not so much, but we can, we can pull that up. Uh, but the geometry here, this is just into the front door, which is really the back door. Uh, you come into the rear of, of, of the place, which is behind here, and, and you go here. And this living room has this great fireplace as well, and a built-in along the edge there, as you can see. Uh, very quickly, this is First Church of Deliverance, a uh, church at 43rd and Wabash uh, in the Bronzeville neighborhood, Bronzeville community. This is this is a, this is an early adaptive reuse building. This was, or at least half of the building was, a hat factory, 
and uh, Charles, uh, Clarence Cobb, pastor of the church back in the 30s, uh, buys it, enlarges it, and covers the building in terracotta. Now, when we think about terracotta, we think about gargoyles and kind of classical applications of it. Here, they were looking, for the, looking toward the future. First Church of Deliverance needs its own book. Uh, it was a progressive church, an early African-American church, uh, an early mega church that could fill up revivals in Old Comiskey Park. They had a national radio audience when the um, Hammond Organ Company uh, created the Hammond B3 organ. If you like soul music like I do, you know what this organ sounds like in gospel. Uh, they sent one of the first ones to this church because they knew it would be heard. Um, a fantastic um, architecture and, and, and lineage as well. Still open as a church. In fact, they've done some repairs to the outside. They all fixed the building up after I take the picture uh, uh, over the past year. So if you go by it now, it looks even better. Uh, this is the interior. This fantastic hanging cross. Uh, which came along in the 1950s. But what I've, I've said about this without joking is that even without, if you're African American, even without a black person being in the space, we know that's our space. That is us. And um, if you want to see what it's like, what it's like in action, uh, they're very open to having you come in. They know the history of the church. I came in with a group last summer and met a guy who gave tours of the church. And he he kind of gave me grief by not saying how many people came to see the church at Old House at Open House Chicago last year, and I said, you know, couldn't do it. But, uh, but on video, you'll see on YouTube the choir coming in underneath this, this cross as they're singing. It's, it's quite a sight. Uh, very quickly, and you've got a little bit of time left, got some time left. Uh, where do you think this is? Just anybody, just those of you who have heard this before, don't, don't say anything. Uh, and Southsiders, I probably should. Oh, okay, Jackson Park, give me, give me one, one more. Just to, Hegwish, all right, uh, neither, all right. This is actually 78th and Eggleston. Eggleston, right? So this is um, Auburn Lake. Uh, this was built, if, if you come in on the Rock Island from Beverly and you cross 79th Street, this is what you see uh, from, the, from the Rock Island Metro train. But this is a, um, it's, it's a, it's a lagoon, two block long lagoon with fish and everything in it. And um, it was developed in the 1890s, and the houses around it were too. This was kind of like a small subdivision that people from the um, Chicago Board of Trade funded and, and lived in. Um, a hidden place, uh, if you go down 79th Street and you get to Eggleston, turn north and you'll run right into it and you'll be, you'll be shocked uh, because it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful spot, an unexpected spot along the lake. Here's another view of it. Uh, if you look real close, you can see the guy fishing for um, they put uh, catfish and trout, and I, I think I give, I give a list in a book about assortment of fish here. But it's really a quiet place right off 79th Street, but you don't know it's there, and you don't know 79th Street is there once you, once you get inside. Um, but a very curious and, and beautiful spot. Uh, this is Oakwood Cemetery, uh, uh, not too far away at 67th and uh, Cottage Grove. Uh, this is another eight, late 1800s cemetery. Um, belongs in the same class, of course, as the cemeteries on the north side. Uh, but at the same time, there was a movement going through park design to turn parks from these Victorian pathways to these kind of naturalistic places. The same movement was going through cemetery design uh, at the same time nationally. So the idea would be with well, these lakes and rolling hills and that kind of thing that it was giving you a sense when you dropped your loved one off uh, there. They were giving you a sense of what the afterlife was like. You can't see it just yet, but here's a glimpse of what the afterlife looks like. And in their early years, uh, places like this were parks. They encouraged people to picnic there, you know, and they visit their loved ones there. Uh, but here, everyone from Harold Washington to uh, Jesse Owens to um, uh, Big Jim Calissimo, the mobster, all buried here uh, under the, uh, the shady trees of Oakwood Cemetery. Uh, and uh, very quickly, Southside Architecture, there's always new stuff coming aboard. This is Jeannie Gang's um, youth center, Levisario Youth Center at 76, and um, ah, I forgot the address. 70, it's West 76th Street. Um, can't think of the address, sorry. It's in the book, it's in the book. And um, this, this is built at the same time as Aqua. Aqua gets all the acclaim in this beautiful little building built on a small budget. Uh, for kids, doesn't get the shine they deserve. So I begin, begin to put it in a book. Uh, this is an, a new bridge over Lakeshore Drive at 
41st or 43rd, uh, the beautiful kind of serpentine bridge that crosses over. Very few, uh, historically, there have been very few crossings over Lakeshore Drive from the neighborhoods to the lake. And now the city in recent years has begun to put them back. And here's the latest. And um, this is the new, the new station at 95th Street, new CTA station, uh, L station at, at 95th, where the red line terminus is. And so to make sure that you know what it's the red line and not the blue line, <laughs> they make it pretty obvious. And with that, uh, that is it. So uh, open the floor up for questions if we can, and can I have a conversation? I have a microphone. Ah, OK. How he has a mic for you. I hear your funny story about the Yale apartments. Ah, okay. So one of the things, the funny story about the Yale apartments. Now, one of the things in photographing this, these buildings is that I'm in the neighborhoods at odd times of the day to catch the right lights, so early in the morning, funny times in the evening, and um, and I'm shooting with a digital camera, but it's on a tripod, and there's a thing called a viewfinder that an angle finder allows me to look into the camera. So it's kind of a time-consuming thing. So by the time I get all set up, people are always trying to come out to figure out what I'm doing, and we have a conversation. Uh, I'm taking a photograph of this building, um, the southern side of it, and, um, and as I come up for air, there's a woman standing right on the corner. And uh, she's looking at me, and I'm looking at her. So I said, um, I, I, and, I, and, the, and, the, and the look was like, what are you doing? So uh, I said, I'm writing a book on architecture, uh, and, um, and I'm photographing the, the, the buildings. So then she turns around. And says, now they're on the no, she's on the corner, so the building is here, right? And I'm where you are. She's here. So she turns this way. She says, he's taking pictures for a book. So a voice that I can't see yet says, oh. So I walk up, and there's a, another woman right there. So I said, what was y'all going to do to me? So, so uh, they, 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 they crack up laughing. And she said, well, you know, we got to watch out. And I said, I know, I know what you're doing. Then a third woman comes out of the entrance. She says, I told you all to leave him alone. And, I said, but you was going to help them if, if they jumped in. And then so she, so she laughs. So, uh, so I promised, to send, and I did. I sent, sent them a book. Uh, hopefully they're fighting over it. And not me, of course, but, the, but, that, but that, that's, the, that's the story. But, but people respect this architecture. I mean, there's a sense that, well, you know, do they know what they have? And like, yes, they do. And, 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 um, and, and that, to me, was part of that, that, that story. So the, the book, the house at 3656 South King Drive that is in such bad shape, is that the one I saw in the preservation picture? It is, I it is. I thought so. Uh -huh. So tell us about how we can, what's on their list, correct? It, 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 it is, and I'm, I'm glad, the, glad you guys are looking at it too. I didn't want to put an abandoned building in the book, but this one I, I made an exception for. So this is the, this is the old Lou Palmer mansion. Uh, so Lou Palmer was this, um, and his wife, Georgia, they were partners uh, politically and socially and, you know, maritally and everything else. They, in their living room on the, on the third floor, second or third floor of that house, helped put to, and the coach house behind it, helped um, organize and put together Harold Washington's winning mayoral campaign back in 83. The building has an earlier life where, when this was Chicago's Gold Coast, where there was a Hammer, Hammer family, um, who built the house, and they were distinguished Chicagoans as, as well. The, the Palmers um, uh, passed away in the early 2000s, and the building f goes into other hands. A developer, uh, who I don't name in the book uh, because we know each other, but he gets grief from me, um, and this developer is, is not doing anything with it. And the house is, is this beautiful house, which deserves a place in a national register, deserves a place as a city landmark for its history alone, let alone its, its architecture. Uh, it's just kind of falling in and open to elements. And I was taking the photographs uh, for the book. Neighbors came out of the house. Are you buying the house? What's happening with the house? And I'd say, no, I'm trying to get some attention to it. Uh, but that's what's happening, happening with the house. I've heard a rumor every other week, oh, somebody's looking at the house, somebody's looking at the house for this use, but nothing ever, so far, as nothing, nothing's, nothing's come to pass. Hi. Hey. Uh, some friends of mine saw the presentation at an earlier date, and they were former long-term South Siders. They want to know when the second and third volumes are going to be coming out. <laughs> tell, them, tell them thank you. Um, 
you know, I, I didn't, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of gathering string, maybe for a second volume. Uh, so talk to me in a year. Maybe I'll have a better answer, answer for you. But tell them thank you. Tell them thank you. Yeah, I oh, I noticed in a few of the um, the photographs of the buildings, there might have been there was a child in the driveway, kind oh, yeah. of in the background, and a couple of them there were a parked car in front. And I wonder if that's something that is intentional. Certainly, could have like waited for the car to be gone. And I appreciate that detail. And well, I'm just wondering if you could speak about that. Thank you. Uh, well, the one with the child playing in the background, she belongs to the house that I photographed. And it was funny because. Um, you know, she. We remember there's a family sitting around the around the uh, around the thing around the living room. The little girl and the mother's lap is now the little girl who's playing in the driveway. And I'm taking the outside shot, and um, so she was running out to check on me. So I basically waited. She, I realized there's a pattern to it, and I waited until she got there and 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 snapped it. I mean, um, I've got three daughters, and they're grown now. But you know, just the idea of a little girl playing in her own backyard it just was a, was a, was a thing that I that I liked. Um, and, she, and I gave that family the um, framed images of that, and now their the kids are big, and they're they're all proud that they're in the that they're in the photograph. Uh, but with cars and things, you know, I I, I sort of shot it as they were. Sometimes I would wait a bit till some cars cleared out. Sometimes I would, I would wait till a car got into a good position. I gave a joke lecture years ago called the the hoopty stays in the picture, and it was uh, all the uh, shots that were ruined. I thought. Uh, by you know raggedy cars, you know, '87, uh, you know Beretta, you know, you know, uh, you know that always, that always gets left in front of the house that I'm looking to photograph. But after a while, there's a certain beauty to it, right? In, in a way. So I decided I decided to leave them in and not 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 go crazy over. It. Good question, though. Lee, my question is about um, the mayor's focus on Invest Southwest and some of the very communities that you take these gorgeous pictures from. Um, I love the book because it has such a beautiful narrative about it. Thank you. Which we don't hear a lot in the daily news. Uh, do you think that um, communities like Pullman, right, they're seeing a renaissance, mm -hmm. but that, the, that we will ever see the coming back of a lot of these other gorgeous communities that we've lost? You know, I hope so. I mean, what, what, what I sort of say in the book, and I've said in lectures uh, after the book, is that the city is really at a crossroads. Um, it must now decide, and time will tell us if it has decided, whether it wants to reinvest substantially in these communities or whether it wants to pretend that it does. One of the things that I've said to the mayor's people, and I say in the book, is that the south side alone is the size of Philadelphia in terms of square miles, right? So giving someone five units of affordable housing on the corner of 65th in Maryland doesn't do much, right? It takes city scale planning, but also city scale investment uh, to really pull these areas back. And, and um, the question then becomes, and time will show, I mean, Invest Southwest, where she's targeting investment, wants to target investment and philanthropic dollars along retail streets on the south and west sides. This is a good start. Uh, I told, uh, had discussion with Maurice Cox, the new, um, uh, uh, planning commissioner, I think the figure they're looking at for the first year was $250 million. So I said, just for kicks and giggles, that L station at 95th Street, he, he has the book, that's $300 million. That's one L station. I said, so, you know, you bail down Lake Michigan with a cup, you know, unless you really are going to put some sustained money into it. And he says, I know, I know, I know. So, so time, time will tell. But one thing is we can't have that the south and west sides, given how large they are, just can't let them drift this way. So I think you know the, we, we gotta solve pension problems and all these things, all the things that the previous generations have left us, uh, it's, it's, it's ours to solve now because not solving them is even worse. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, Hi, I'm in grad school now, and last semester I did um, a lot of research on the new Obama Center mm -hmm. and um, kind of the, the CBA that the residents of Woodlawn are putting together and people who are saying they're already getting priced out of that neighborhood in advance of the Obama Center being constructed. I'm curious on your take on that, um, whether you think the Obama Center 
foundation shows the right spot, whether you do think Woodlawn residents are, are getting priced out of that neighborhood, what you think a good solution might be. Well, um, I, I said, well, there's a couple things. In, in the book, I, I said I don't like the design. Uh, I'll start there because uh, it's, it's, if you're going to put it in a park, if I have to hold my nose and, and it has to go in the park, uh, that 220-foot tower is beans. I mean, that's crazy. Um, a building that doesn't look organic, that a building, if it's built in a park, should look like it's come, it comes from the park. Uh, it's kind of, does somebody say brutal? I mean, it is kind of brutal, kind of stuck there and all this stone and granite. So design-wise, I don't like it. Um, what the book doesn't address, but I've talked about is, is, that, is that I wish they would have found a different site. The site that I preferred, and I think I wrote about this years ago, is the site where the Green Line stop is on Garfield, right across from where the University of Chicago already owns the Arts Incubator and a few other buildings right there. Um, on that side of the street, the, the north side of 55th Street, the city and the CTA and the university together own about 20 acres. And there could have been possibly the idea of, a, of an urban uh, transit-oriented museum um, in the neighborhood, um, which would have been, to me, closer to his stated ideals as a president, as a candidate, than this kind of Shangri-La off, off in the park um, that doesn't really, in my opinion, do much for the park. Thank you, thank you. Last time I said that, uh, I was at uh, the Silver Room in Hyde Park, and the next week, I wound up uh, with, uh, uh, in a meeting with Michael Stratmanis, the, the, uh, uh, one of the, the honchos of the, of the library and the foundation, and we just, just laughed. He didn't, you know, he can't beat me up, so what, what is he going to do, right? <laughs> he probably could. But thank you, thank you. Uh, other questions? Oh, got some, got some here, all right. So you made a comment about uh, this outside being the, the, perhaps the richest place outside of downtown in the city for architecture. Why? Well, you know, first you've got... Not uh, why is it true, but why did it occur? Oh, why did it occur? Well, you know, th there's a lot of things happened. Uh, so, 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 of course, the city annexes the south side, which much of the south side in 1889. So the city grows exponentially. What the south side has going for it is it has real, national railroads running through it. It has close access to the lake, close ex, I mean, access to the lake uh, for industry, access to the Chicago River uh, for, for, for industry. And, um, and it was a, 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 an open slate. North side is beginning to, even then, beginning to, 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 to fill in. And what you've got is developers, not a Daniel Burnham, really, but developers who are coming in uh, and they're taking advantage of, these, of this space to build houses with broad streets and, and things. You've got um, individuals like um, ah, Cornell, Paul Cornell uh, in Hyde Park who gives land to the Illinois Central Railroad. Here, take it. Put, put, your, put your station there because he knows he's going to build houses close by and nice houses because they'll have the real access downtown. So you, you have these things kind of, kind of happening. And then this kind of instant city, this boom town that's happening. And, you know, there, there has to be space for workers but also for bosses. You've got the stockyards already operating. So the, um, the first Gold Coast is beginning to line up not just along Prairie Avenue close to downtown but along um, King Drive, South Parkway, and Michigan Avenue, and Drexel uh, along um, in, into the Bronzeville, Bronzeville neighborhood. So all this stuff is kind of happening all in the same kind of, you know, 20 to 30 year, year span. Um, Chicago, the South Side makes Chicago, Chicago, uh, essentially. And um, I think hasn't really been taken care of, uh, not, not really been rewarded uh, uh, because of that. But all those things together are kind of happening at once. And you know, and you can get downtown pretty quickly from the South Side, even, even today. Commenting about the vocation people drive out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. My wife and I had a house in the in Chicago. We would get up in the morning. Two dogs. It's probably yeah. We would leave early. We would leave early in the morning with our two dogs and head to Massachusetts. And at the sunrise over the vocational school. It was just a tremendous sight. It My is. question is, uh, in your dis uh, discussion of it, uh, what's happened to the vocational school today? It looks like it's all boarded up. Well, you know, the um, one thing is the population, the student population shrank 
built for 4,000. When I went there, late 70s, early 80s, my, my, graduation, my graduating class was 900. So about 3,600 students there now. Uh, but then in the 80s, now it's about 600 or less. So much of it is closed off. Those shop wings that are closest to the Skyway that you see probably best are closed off. The city has set aside, but they haven't spent it yet, $75 million uh, to create a STEM academy or a STEM curriculum uh, in the school, and they want to remove parts that, of that Anthony Wing uh, for a new building. That probably, I think, got people to seek landmark, try to seek landmark status for it. But that's up in the air now, so we, we don't know. So, so the fear is that without landmark, status without protection, either it'll get uh, this unsympathetic addition to it that no one has seen design-wise yet, or it'll be demolition by neglect, and that part of, will just, that part of, the, of the building uh, will just, uh, just kind of fade away and have to be torn down at some point. All right, any more questions? Oh, there's one in the, the two, two, all right. I know in a lot of areas like Bridgeport, um, a lot of the Catholic churches are closing. You know, you have the Catholic Croatian Church, the Catholic Irish Church. You know, um, what, what do you envision they can do with these churches? Uh, it, it seems like, you know, they could turn it into housing for seniors or something, but it just seems like they're outdated and time to go even though, you know, they're churches. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I wish the archdiocese, the Roman Catholic archdiocese, would be more forward-looking about what to do with these places. What, what happens is, what's been happening, in the old days, you used to sell them to the Baptists, right? You know, you know here, you, you all buy. And, and, and now they don't do that, right? So they, um, they, they, they tear them down. So um, uh, St. James, uh, St. James Church, I think, at Wabash in 21st, that one came down. In the book, Let's see, I don't, want to, I don't want to spoil it for you if you haven't read it, but there's something that happens, you close it, there's something that happens to a church at 53rd and Loomis that if you don't know already will make you angry. Uh, but, but that seems to be what, what the archdiocese, now you want to know what it is, right? But, uh, but um, uh, gosh, do you, okay, do you want me, okay, do you want me to tell you what it is or you want, want me not to tell? <laughs> tell us. So uh, there was a church, St. John of God Church at, 50, at, at uh, 52nd and Loomis, right across from, from Sherman Park. Right, and uh, beautiful uh, Italian Renaissance church built. I want to say 1908. Henry Schlacks was like the Frank Lloyd Wright of their, you know, in terms of impact of their church construction. This church closed in 1990 and sat empty, uh, and nobody. And, and that neighborhood is a bit challenged. Nobody put graffiti on it. Nobody broke into it. I learned to photograph architecture by practicing on that building. It had this beautiful uh, portico. This an absolutely beautiful building, and. Um, the archdiocese decides, I want to say 2012, 2013, that after all those years of being empty and still in beautiful condition, uh, that enough was enough. So they took the limestone facade off the building, flayed it, as Lynn Becker, the architecture uh, uh, critic says, and they applied it to a new church they built near Antioch, up near the Wisconsin border. They leave this kind of molded brick mess there for a few weeks, and they end up tearing it down. So um, this church, Polish Catholic Church, storied P Polish Catholic Church, um, it's, it's now it's just, just another vacant lot uh, in the area of town that doesn't need vacant lots. Um, so I'm hoping at some point, that, and now we get, we're hearing about the more Catholic school closings happening, that there's some, you know, there's some more forward thinking about what to do with these buildings because you know the population is shrinking. There's a church that's in the book that I thought was gonna to get torn down um, at 45th and Honoré. Uh, you'll check it out, you'll, you'll see a beautiful church from 1888. It looks like it could have been 50 years earlier. Uh, and, um, and so I'm, I'm really concerned about these buildings, as, as are you. Try to pick up on what was asked over there is, what impact did the Columbian Exposition have on the South Side's growth in architecture? You know, you know quite a bit. I mean, that building you saw, the Yale Apartments, uh, was built to, 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 to um, catch the, the overflow, the rentals from, from that, even though it's a mile and a half west of the fair, um, not too far from the uh, murder mansion in Devil in the White City, actually. Uh, where I live, even in Pullman, there's Market Hall Apartments, which are in the book, these kind of curved apartments. Pullman, by 18, 
90 is mostly built up, we're gonna be mostly built up, and these apartments come along as a way to have, as, a, as places for fair owners, fair goers to stay, because it was quick access down the Illinois Central from Pullman to, uh, to Hyde Park. Um, but, but certainly, I mean, there's the development of White City Amusement Park a little bit later, which kind of, sh you know, heralds back to that, to that time. So the, the World's Fair does play a role in sort of putting this part of the, of the country uh, and this part of the city on the, on the map. Plays an, plays an important role. But even without the fair, I think you still have seen, that with industry and other things, you still have seen what happened happen in, in, in some way. Young lady in the back. Hi, Lee. Hey. So I'm a budding photographer, and I've kind of been labeled as a landscape photographer, mostly nature. Mm -hmm. But as you as a photographer, as I was skimming through the book, um, your photograph spoke to me. Thank you. So looking through your lens, what, what made you decide the angles, the lighting? I mean, what motivated you to capture what you captured? Well, you know, I, um, thank you, good, good question. I should say that I started photography late. I was in my 30s before I even thought about buying a camera, and even only then to photograph my daughters growing up. And photography of architecture just kind of fell out of the sky on me. Um, uh, but in, in the book, you know, one of the things I wanted to do was, um, well, there's a couple things that are happening. One of, the, one of the things that I was intentional about is shooting the buildings under blue skies, uh, because blue skies, kind of give us hope and I thought there was too much architecture of you know foreboding clouds and demolished buildings on the south side I wanted a different kind of um, look uh, I also used and those of you who aren't camera nerds please forgive me but I also used a thing called a tilt shift lens it's a perspective control lens so so you know how it is when taking a photograph with your camera or anything else if, the, if you want to get all the building in so you have a tendency to hold the camera up or the, or the phone up uh, to get everything in what that does is it kind of makes, actually there was, there was, there was a good example uh, behind this that I didn't take, but uh, it kind of makes, well, you, you can see a little bit of what happens, uh, and, not, and this is not a criticism, this is just a, you can see a little bit of what it looks like with this image here, which is not mine, I should say. Uh, so what a tilt shift lens does is it allows me to, the, the perspective changes and allows me to be able to get all of the building in without holding the, the, the camera up, long story short, because, because it was important to, for the buildings to look like I wanted them to look when you, when, when you saw them. Um, I'm also nearsighted without my glasses, even with sometimes, so when this was an exhibit, um, I, I printed the photographs very large. Uh, I wanted people to feel like they could walk into these buildings. And um, so all those things kind of guided uh, what, what we're doing. Oh, got, well, it's up to Come you. Here, last mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Lee, in the book, you might have maybe one black and white photo, and that's yeah. the Hilda Rothschild nurse's residence. Why did you choose to use that in black and white and the rest color? It was, yeah, was it, the, was it the, uh, the circular building from Michael Reese? Oh, that one, I mean, okay. Because that was, a, well, Michael Reese Hospital, which I wanted to, t wanted to talk about in the book, um, they tore it down before, that's the only, maybe there's one other old photograph that wasn't taken expressly for the book, and frankly, I couldn't find the color version of that photograph that I took, and, and, we, and, and we tried, we, we tried, and couldn't find it, so then I thought, well, okay, that one, that one has to be black and white then. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank, thank you. you.